A production fee for your hometown health connection was made by Buffalo Healthy Living Magazine and its sponsors. Most people don't like to talk about it, but having a gastrointestinal problem is common. According to the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive and Kidney Disease, about 70 million Americans suffer from gastrointestinal problems, leading to nearly 250,000 deaths each year. Today we'll talk about the most common digestive conditions like GERD, IBS, celiac disease, and more. We'll learn about their symptoms and the most effective treatments available. There's no need to suffer in silence. We'll get the life-saving information you need on this edition of your Hometown Health Connection. I'm Samantha Latshaw. Welcome to your Hometown Health Connection. We all occasionally experience an upset stomach. So how are you supposed to know the difference between when your GI symptoms are just a temporary inconvenience and when they are a sign of a digestive disorder? Joining us is Dr. Sultan Mahmoud from General Physician PC. He is a board certified gastroenterologist and clinical assistant professor of medicine at Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences at the University of Buffalo. He specializes in gastroenterology and irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, and large polyp removal. We also have Sarah Hai, a physician assistant who focuses on gastroenterology and works with with Dr. Mahmood. Dr. Mahmood and Sarah, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks a lot for having us. So doctor, tell me about what is gastroenterology? So gastroenterology is a very broad specialty. It's an internal medicine subspecialty. So after three years of internal medicine training, we do an extra three years of focused training in gastroenterology. So we cover everything from the mouth to the anus. So everything that's in between, that's in our specialty. Um, and we also cover hepatology and pancreas as well. Wow, so what actual issues do you work on? So when we talk about gastroenterology, like I said, it's a very broad specialty. So it includes the common GI conditions like gastroesophageal reflux disease or peptic ulcer disease um, or inflammatory bowel disease, but some of the rare ones as well, um, like celiac disease um, and some of the other neoplasms of the pancreas and the liver. All right, that sounds like a whole a lot of ground to cover there. Yeah. So how do you differ from, let's say, a colorectal surgeon? So colorectal surgery, as the name implies, is a surgical subspecialty. So after they complete their five years of surgical training, uh, they do an extra year of focused training in colorectal surgery. So in that particular realm, they take care of the surgical issues which arise inside the GI tract. So the common reason that we send patients over to colorectal surgery is patients who have a colorectal cancer. Um, or patients who have hemorrhoids and very rarely patients who have bad diverticular disease and they need a surgery for that. So you mentioned earlier, you know, some of the buzzwords that we all hear, acid reflux, uh, GERD, very commonly known, but talk to me specifically, what are some of the upper GI uh, digestive issues? Yeah, so maybe Sarah can cover that because Sarah does work w with us a lot, especially on the clinical side. So Sarah, do you wanna take this question? So the most common symptom that we probably see uh, in the clinic is acid reflux. I mean, most commonly that'll present like heartburn, but it can present like uh, an atypical symptom like difficulty swallowing or chest pain or sometimes even a hoarse voice. So Sarah, talk to me a little bit more about the actual symptoms from what you just described. So a lot of people describe a burning sensation in their chest or they'll describe chest tightness and sometimes it can even be mistaken as heart problems then we come to find out that it's related to acid reflux. Can you uh, go a little deeper as to how to differentiate? Because just like you mentioned, sometimes you could accidentally think it's something in relation to your heart. Yeah, so that's a lot of times where Dr. Mahmood would come in. Um, he would do the upper endoscopy or a scope, which would be able to determine the extent of the reflux or the severity of it. Now, do some foods tend to trigger the acid reflux? We all hear, stay away from the tomato sauce and some spicy foods. What can help us with that? Yeah, certainly dietary and lifestyle modifications are a big part of this. So you definitely want to avoid 
like you said, the spicy food, red sauce, um, a lot of caffeine is a big trigger, alcohol. These are all going to play a part in making things a little bit worse or triggering your symptoms. Okay, so we talk about now the, um, the upper GI systems. So what about the lower? What, what kind of conditions are we talking about here? So lower symptoms, uh, there's, there's so many and they're really variable, but most commonly we're going to see symptoms like diarrhea and constipation or, or um, syndromes like irritable bowel syndrome or inflammatory bowel disease. You know, in unfortunate cases, we will see colon cancer as well, which is something that, you know, the doctors like Dr. Mahmood would see uh, during a colonoscopy. So with the, uh, Dr. Mahmood, with the lower GI uh, conditions, what are some of the one, most common ones that you see? And perhaps talk to me more a little bit about, you know, putting something off and how that can turn into something more severe. Yeah, I think this is a very important point. Um, we are seeing more and more um, inflammatory bowel disease and even colon cancer in the younger population. Um, so the younger patients tend to say, oh, I'm, I'll be fine. I'm just having some blood in the stool. It's probably coming from the hemorrhoids. But what I would say is just take your symptoms seriously, uh, especially if you're experiencing any of the what we call alarm symptoms. So when I say alarm symptoms, that means weight loss blood in the stool, or if your blood counts are low, so if you go to see your primary care physician and your blood counts are low, take your symptoms seriously um, and do get checked out by gastroenterologist. Um, the most common symptoms that we see in our clinic is abdominal pain, constipation, and diarrhea. Um, and those symptoms can be from something very benign like irritable bowel syndrome, or that can be from something which is, um, which is more chronic, like inflammatory bowel disease, or like I said, even colon cancer. Right, because, you know, we all from time to time experience an upset stomach. But when do we cross the line into something where we need to come see you? So like I said, alarm features are going to be the key. So if you experience any weight loss, I, what I would say is if you see blood in the stool, that is not normal. It could be coming from something benign like a hemorrhoid, but just take that seriously and get yourself checked out. And the best way to do that is to see a gastroenterologist. Now, wh what about different ethnic groups? Is that something that is more prevalent? You mentioned age as a factor. We're seeing it more and more in younger folks. What about ethnic groups? So that is another important point. Um, there are some ethnic groups which are at a high risk of developing certain types of cancer. For the African Americans, they are at a high risk of developing colon cancer. Um, and for Asian immigrants and for Southeast Asian people, they're at a high risk of developing upper GI malignancy, including stomach cancer. So your ethnicity definitely plays a role in that. Wow, now does this steer more male, female? So it's, there's not really a huge difference between male and female when it comes to the ethnicity, uh, but overall men are at actually a high risk of developing colon cancer as compared to women. Now, March is colorectal awareness month. Very important month, right? We sometimes don't want to talk about this stuff, right. but this is important stuff to celebrate, right? right? Because we want to make sure that we have a healthy digestive system. Talk to me about the importance about screening. Yeah, this is actually the best time to talk about this because March is colon cancer awareness month, like you mentioned. Um, we have made a lot of headway when it comes to colon cancer screening. Um, the mortality from colon cancer has decreased by half from what it used to be before the colon cancer screening was instituted like 30, 40 years ago. So I'm really proud to be a part of the gastroenterology community which has made all of that headway and improvement in decreasing the colon cancer mortality. So right now in the US, the screening average is like 60% of the population which are eligible for screening do actually go for screening. So there's a, there's a huge room for improvement over there. Um, and I, I feel that if we can make some strides in improving the number of people who get screened, we can actually decrease the colon cancer mortality even more. Great, great. Now, uh, Sarah, you work very closely with Dr. Mahmoud. You see many folks there. What would you have to say? We talked a little bit earlier about the younger folks. What can you say to them about getting screened? Yeah, like Dr. Mahmoud said, I would just say that any slight abnormality, it could be something benign, but I would take it very seriously and come on over to see us and then we can walk you through it and we can do the test to make sure that it's nothing serious. So to both of you, talk to me about what that screening process looks like. I'm sure a lot of people are fearful and don't know what to expect. So a colonoscopy um, is a screening tool that we use most commonly probably in our GI practice and there's a colonoscopy clean out that we have to do beforehand which will get your bowel cleaned out in order to visualize everything and then we're able to visualize polyps and, and remove them before they turn into anything more serious. 
Dr. Mahmood, if you'd like to add to that. Yeah, so what I would say is that what I tell all of my patients is the worst part of the colonoscopy is the bowel prep. That's the one thing that everybody is afraid of. Um, we have made some improvement. There are more options available when it comes to bowel preps. So if you have had issues with your bowel prep in the past, that does not mean that you're going to get the same prep now. We have options and we can talk to you about a lower volume prep, which we have available now, which might be easier to take as compared to the other one. But even with that, I mean, the bowel prep is not easy, um, but still, if you think about it, you have to do it like once every 10 years or so, it's, it's still worth it when it comes to decreasing the cancer mortality. So when you say low volume prep, what does that mean exactly? So there are different options available right now. Um, the most commonly used prep right now is the Miralax prep that you have to mix with Gatorade. So that's a 32 ounce bottle of Miralax that you mix with Gatorade or some other liquid that you prefer. And then you can take that the night before the procedure and some magnesium citrate the morning of the procedure to do the bowel prep. But the newer volume preps which are coming up uh, without going too much detail into their brand names, um, they would be another like 12 or 18 ounces of fluid that you have to take and follow that with some liquid of your choice, which is clear liquid um, to take that down. Okay, not too bad. Yeah. Now, when you're in there, are you asleep? Because I'm sure a lot of people don't want to experience that. Right. So, like I said, the worst part is the bowel prep. So once you come in, you've done the bowel prep, colonoscopy is easy. So because we use sedation for all of our procedures and actually most of our procedures are done with what we call MAC. So MAC means that it's propofol sedation. So the patients are completely asleep. They go in, they get the sedation, they're asleep, they wake up and the procedure is done. They don't feel anything during the procedure. Great, so it doesn't sound like it's too much that you have to put on your side to have some life-saving treatment done. Yes, that is correct. Fit testing and Cologuard, how does that differ? So when it comes to colon cancer screening, there are different options available. Um, some are better than the other ones for one reason or another. The tier one um, guidelines for colon cancer screening, they recommend a stool fit test, which is a fecal immunochemical test or a colonoscopy as the preferred modality. So the FIT test um, is a yearly test in which we look for microscopic amounts of blood in the stool. Um, a newer test which has come into the market is the Cologar test, which is becoming very popular. Um, so that includes a FIT component to it. So that is a FIT test, plus it also looks for microscopic DNA particles from cancer or from polyps. So that test has a higher sensitivity as compared to the FIT test. But then there is a problem with cost with that test because that test is more expensive, um, around like $600 or so. And if that comes back as positive, patients still have to undergo a colonoscopy. So overall, from a screening standpoint, that is still not preferred um, as a screening modality. So right now, the preferred screening modality is either a stool fit test, which is a yearly basis, or you get a colonoscopy every 10 years. I see, and then the fit test is something you can do in the comfort of your own home. Both fit test and Cologuard are available as a mail-in order, so you can order the mail kit, um, do that at home and mail that over and you get the results back. Or your primary care physician uh, would get the results back and then if that comes back as positive, um, then you would undergo a colonoscopy. I think it's important to remember that these tests do have their own limitations. Of course, with the colonoscopy, the limitation is the need for a bowel prep and having to come in, get sedation and get the procedure. But the limitation of the stool-based fit test is that it, it's not really a great test to pick up polyps in the colon. So if you have cancer, it's a good chance that that test would come back as positive but it's not a good test to pick up polyps. So um, when we do a colonoscopy, we remove polyps, we decrease the cancer formation, and that is not really available with the FIT testing. We'll have much more on digestive health, but before we cut to break, a reminder that you can connect with Dr. Sultan Mahmood at General Physician PC at one of the many locations shown on your screen. Their phone number is 716-626 2644 and online at gppconline.com. Ahead, how GERD or acid reflux may increase the risk of some cancers. Buffalo Healthy Living Magazine is a free, full color magazine distributed throughout Western New York. Now, more than ever, as we all want our families and friends to be safe and well. Buffalo Healthy Living Magazine is devoted to health. 
fitness and nutrition for people of all ages. It's a great read and also has great recipes. Pick up Buffalo Healthy Living magazine all over our hometown or go online anytime at buffalohealthyliving.com. Welcome back to your hometown health connection. I'm Samantha Latshaw. We're continuing the discussion about gastrointestinal disorders with Dr. Sultan Mahmoud and physician assistant Sarah Hai. Now, GERD is something that we all talk about, acid reflux, very common in, in the community, right? A lot of people have acid reflux. Tell me exactly what GERD is. So GERD, um, as the name implies, is gastroesophageal reflux disease, which means it is reflux of the gastric contents um, or the fluid inside the stomach up into the esophagus. And esophagus does not like the acid. So when the, the acid comes up into the esophagus, patients can have different symptoms based on whatever um, sensitivity they have. The most common symptom that they would feel is the burning sensation because that uh, acid in a way is burning the esophagus. Uh, but in some patients, they would have more atypical symptoms. So when I say atypical symptoms, so instead of burning, they might just feel oh there's like something which is coming up into my throat um, or they would have some of the other rare symptoms which can include um, like chronic cough or asthma or sinusitis and some of the GI symptoms. So what exactly what can be done to treat uh, GERD? So GERD is a very common GI condition um, more than 50% of the US population have symptoms of GERD at some point in their life um, and the best initial thing that you can do for this is lifestyle modifications. So when I say lifestyle modification, diet is going to be paramount in all of that. Um, there are foods which increase the acid production in the stomach and those include fatty food, fried food, um, spicy food which increase the acid production from the stomach and there are foods which um, decrease the barrier between the esophagus and the stomach. So there is a muscle ring at the bottom of the esophagus which is called the lower esophagus sphincter and the goal of that muscle ring is to remain tight and prevent the acid from coming back up. There are, there are certain foods which relax that muscle sphincter and those include caffeine, peppermint, chocolates, soda pops, so those are all things which can relax that muscle sphincter and everything would come back up. So all the yummy stuff. Oh, unfortunately. <laughs> so more on food, I'm curious, what about like foods in the family from the, the nightshades that cause inflammation like tomatoes and potatoes and eggplant, what about that? So those foods do have some role in increasing the acid production too, especially tomatoes um, from what our experience is and that's what the studies have shown. But for the other ones, it depends on what your own individual sensitivity is. How can I treat this or can I with some over-the-counter products? Sarah, perhaps you can elaborate on that. So there's a lot of over-the-counter products that are available. Um, things like Pepsid or Famotidine is available over-the-counter or Prilosec, Nexium. These are all medications that we use in our office and we prescribe them, but you can also pick them up over-the-counter. Usually on the label it'll say don't take this for longer than 14 days before consulting a physician. If you're really having symptoms longer than that or even once you start taking it, it's a good idea to still consult with us to make sure you're on right track. So Sarah, how, when is it, when do you cross the line where those over-the-counter products uh, are just not enough? Yeah, so I mean, if you've been taking those medications for a long time, if you're taking higher doses than is recommended, or if you still find yourself having symptoms despite taking the medications, that's an indication to us that maybe there's a little bit more of a severe problem going on and we might need to do some uh, more evaluation, like an endoscopy. Doctor, there's some studies that show that GERD or acid reflux, they show a connection to some types of cancers. Another very important point, um, so chronic acid reflux does lead to some long-term complications and cancer is one of them. Um, there are certain populations which are at a high risk of developing cancer as compared to the other ones with acid reflux. So if you are white, if you're obese, um, and you're above the age of 50 with long-standing acid reflux, you should get checked out because you might have developed either a precancerous condition in the esophagus, like Barrett's esophagus, um, and that is something that if you get diagnosed with early, you can get into a surveillance program and we can catch cancer 
before it happens or at a very early stage where we can treat it endoscopically. Because if you, the esophagus cancer by itself has a very high mortality, and most of the times that we catch it, it is already too late. What does that look like putting you through some type of screening uh, or you said a program to keep an eye on it? So if you have the risk factors um, like I talked about, um, the screening is done by an upper endoscopy, uh, which means that you come in, you don't have to do any special prep or anything, just don't eat anything um, the night before the procedure. Um, and you come in, we use sedation for all of our procedures. You go in, we go in, quickly go in with a special scope with a camera in front of it into the esophagus and the stomach. And we take some samples and biopsies depending on what we find. Um, and if you do, if you are diagnosed with Barrett's esophagus, then you would enter into that screening program, which is an endoscopy every three to five years. Wow, that's some vital information there, making some mental notes to send some family members <laughs> yeah. to you. Uh, so as far as the acid reflux, I want to go a little deeper on that. I mean, you know, is it every day? Like if I'm feeling it every day or a couple times a week, I'm doing what you're saying, I'm doing the dietary changes and I'm right. still having it. Right, so I, what, what I like to tell my patients is that if you're needing to use the stomach acid medications for more than two to three times in a week, that is something that you should get checked out for, especially after you have already done the lifestyle changes that we talked about with regards to the diet. But there was one other thing I forgot to cover, which is that the nighttime is usually the worst time because when you lay down, it's very easy for your stomach contents to come up into the esophagus. So there are other lifestyle changes, like don't eat or drink anything two to three hours before going to bed. So like empty out your stomach when you lay down and use something to raise the head of the bed up. Um, I recommend using a wedge pillow mm -hmm. a lot. That is a pillow that can, you can place underneath your back and that just changes the angle. And that actually has been shown to work almost as good good as the stomach acid medications. Wow, now correct me if I'm wrong, I read that if you lay to the left, on the left side is better because the way your digestive system is built, is that correct? That, that is correct too, yes. Okay, good to know, uh, Google did work. <laughs> It was right this time. <laughs> well, I, I hope, you know, this is helping a lot of people because there's a lot of folks out there that suffer from, you know, GERD and acid reflux. But let's move on to IBS. What is that? So irritable bowel syndrome um, is a very common GI condition. So it's part of what we call the functional GI disorders. So a recent study from the US showed that more than 40% of the population in the US would qualify for a functional GI disorder. And irritable bowel syndrome is one of those common GI disorders that most patients have. Um, so irritable bowel syndrome is what we've changed the diagnosis to what we call a positive diagnosis now. Previously, it was a diagnosis of exclusion. So we would do like all types of tests in the world and then everything comes back as negative and then we say, you know, now you have irritable bowel syndrome. But now it's a, it's a positive diagnosis. So if you fit the criteria, if you don't have any alarm features, we can actually make a diagnosis just based on your symptoms without the need for doing endoscopies. So what are the symptoms, the signs and symptoms I'm looking for here? So irritable bowel syndrome is mostly what we call a colon disorder. Um, so the most common symptoms would be a change in your bowel habits associated with abdominal pain. So if you have, if you have abdominal pain and you have, you have change in bowel habits and it's happening more than two to three times per week, you would fit the criteria for irritable bowel syndrome. Now, is this something that I can grow out of if I change my eating habits? Is that something that's naturally can go away? So irritable bowel syndrome is a chronic GI condition. So once you have it, you pretty much have it. Mm -hmm. um, but patients do go through flare. So they would have a flare for whatever reason, depends on their type, depends on a new infection that they got. Um, but that can get better on its own or with some diet changes, but it can always come back later on in their life too. So how does that uh, differ from IBD? So inflammatory bowel disease, as the name implies, is an inflammation condition of the GI tract. So when we do a colonoscopy or blood work in patients of inflammatory bowel disease, we see a lot of inflammation. Um, so that would mean increased inflammation markers in the blood or on a colonoscopy, they would have ulcers or bleeding in the colon. So that is inflammatory bowel disease. The treatment is very different too. So inflammatory bowel disease is also a chronic condition, but that is treated with anti-inflammation and immune suppressing medications and irritable bowel syndrome treatment mainly focusing on focuses on management of symptoms okay now sarah let's talk about an, another very popular topic celiac disease what is that 
Yeah, I'm sure everyone has probably heard of celiac disease and probably a lot of people have diagnosed themselves with it. But there's a big difference between celiac disease and gluten sensitivity. So celiac disease is actually an autoimmune condition where your body is essentially attacking its own cells anytime you ingest gluten. So there's a lot of inflammation and malabsorption that can take place. Gluten sensitivity, um, you'll get a lot of the same symptoms, abdominal discomfort, bloating, but you're not actually having the risk of inflammation to your body. So what does that feel like if you are, let's say, someone who has the gluten sensitivity but perhaps not have celiac disease? How can I differentiate the two? Symptomatically, they probably feel very similar, but that's where we would come in. We would be able to differentiate between the two using blood work or sometimes endoscopy using biopsies. But gluten ingestion is a big trigger for IBS as well, so you're going to get a lot of the same symptoms of bloating, discomfort, sometimes diarrhea as well. Okay. I see, so if you suspect that you are sensitive to gluten, the only sure way to find out is to come get, see you and get a screening done. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of products on the market that are gluten free. Is, is that something that we all should be looking for or is that just specifically for those who have celiac disease? What I would say is that don't just put yourself on a gluten free diet um, without being checked out completely by a gastroenterologist um, because there are some benefits to, um, to gluten in your diet. Um, and if you keep your diet restricted, one, that is going to be expensive, but that restrictive diet does have some long-term consequences too when it comes to other nutrition um, in your diet. So I've seen patients who have lost too much weight or they have developed other nutritional deficiencies, including iron deficiency, just being on a severe gluten-free diet. Wow, that is fabulous information. Yes, because I could see a lot of people yeah. putting themselves on this restrictive diet unnecessarily. And like you mentioned, you now lack other nutrients. Can right. you talk a little bit more about that? I think it's very important. So most of the patients who do follow a gluten-free diet, they would also restrict some other foods um, in their diet. Um, it can lead to like vitamin deficiencies and iron deficiencies are the most common ones that I have seen in my practice. Um, but again, I mean, it depends on what type of diet you're following um, with your gluten-free diet. And then the iron deficiency can lead to anemia right. and all sorts of things. Right, that is correct. It's fabulous information. Now, is there anything else you would like to add? The importance, you know, it's, it's a big deal. March is a very important month again. It's, it's a colorectal awareness month. Is there anything else that you would like to add and just push that message home, the importance of getting screened? So what I would say is, Prevention is better than cure. Um, instead of waiting for something bad to happen, just get yourself checked out. There are options available. If you feel like colonoscopy is not for you because that is too much to take, we have other options available, including stool-based testing, uh, which also decrease the colon cancer mortality. So not everybody needs a colonoscopy, um, although that is the preferred modality, but every screening modality has their own benefit. Talk to your doctor and see what options are available. Fabulous. Sarah, any final thoughts? I just want to reiterate what Dr. Mahmoud said, and that is prevention is better than cure. So don't hesitate to schedule. It's not as scary as you think, and it's definitely a good idea to get tested. You can connect with Dr. Sultan Mahmoud at General Physician PC at one of the many locations on your screen. Their phone number is 716-626-2644 and online at gppconline.com. Gastrointestinal symptoms can vary from intensity from very mild to serious. If you're frequently experiencing these symptoms we talked about today, your body could be trying to tell you you have a digestive condition. Remember to listen to your body. This is the first step to feeling better. I'm Samantha Latshaw. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and be well. A production fee for the preceding presentation of Your Hometown Health Connection was made by Buffalo Healthy Living Magazine and its sponsors.